All right, welcome back to Athlete's Pursuit. I'm very excited for today's episode because we have a very special guest, someone who I consider one of my favorite people on this planet. I think you're a, you're a, you're a sister to me, Christina, and I'm so excited to have you here. So Christina Centenari is joining us. Thanks for joining the show. Thanks for having me, Joe. You're the first guest of this year, man. <laughs> well, you're like a big brother to me, so here we are. Here we are. <laughs> here we are. It only seemed right, you know, to do it this way. Feels natural. It does. Feels good. All right, so we're going to dive into some fun topics today. We're going to keep it conversational, but we're going to get deep, I'm sure, in some areas. As we do. As we do. <laughs> Casey and I have a lot of great conversations stemming from just training, but man, we get... We get into it. We get into it. We get where there's tears and there's, <laughs> but it's good. It is. It's healthy, it's man. It's so good. It's just about growth, like tapping into some things, developing more self-awareness, appreciation for yourself. So before we get into all that, I got to hype you up real quick. You ready for this? All right. All right. You just all sit right. back. Be gentle. Be yeah. Gentle. I'll hype you up real <laughs> quick though. All right. So if you're not familiar with Christina Centenari, let me get you familiar with Christina Centenari. So she is a tonal coach with me. We're, we've been working together for over two years now. We actually knew each other a long time ago too. I met Christina when she was at Rumble. We did. Oh, yeah, man. And you were at Tone House. When we were both in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Young ones getting into this industry. All right, so a list of accomplishments for Christina, and they are bountiful. Here we go. Christina has been a Division I tennis player, a Division I crew for one year. I did not know that. She has completed 11 half Ironmans, one full Ironman, seven marathons. She has certifications in SFG1 Kettlebell, RRCA as a run coach, RYT 200 hour, that's a registered yoga cert, FRC functional range conditioning certification, kin stretch certification, and FRC internal strength model certification. Is there anything else? Yes, maybe. I feel like I was maybe forgetting some stuff, but honestly, that's good. Unbelievable, <laughs> man. Here's my first question for you. Why 11 and a half Ironmans? What, is it, what are you thinking, dude? Okay, this is a great place to start. Great yeah. place to start, actually. So after I sort of We'll get here. But after I, I gave up sport in college, I was like, I, I, what's next? I don't know what to do next. And I had a female mentor in my life who was racing Ironmans. And I thought it was so cool. And uh, I expressed to her one day that I'm interested. And she's like, uh, she was, phew. You think I'm a go-getter. Like, this woman was, like, crazy. <laughs> Is. And uh, in the best way. And so she just encouraged me to do it. And the first one I did, I was still in college. Um, I think I, I raced that first half Ironman barely ever having ridden my bike. Wow. So, like, race day was the first time I rode my bike. I'm in college. I'm not going to ride my bike. You know what I mean? Yep. Okay. Race day was the first day. And then... Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I didn't really swim either. So that was, I just went and swam a mile and some change. Um, and I got hooked. I completely went into that with like no training, but I got hooked. How did you do that with no training? Good question. Good question. You, uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I'm naturally, you know, I, I think that I had enough grit and determination. Um, I tend to do this where I, I sort of approach things in life that other people may think, oh, you need to prepare because this is a big deal. I sort of am just like, I'll be okay. And then, yeah. you know, it's a struggle when I get there, but in my mind, I'm like, I, I signed up for this. This is, you know, this is sort of willingly putting myself in the face of this challenge. And I knew that this was going to happen. Um, so I think I, I have this like, sort of special uh, ability to to just, whether you call it stupidity or <laughs> bravery, to just throw myself in situations like that and kind of see what happens. Sometimes it's a beautiful thing. I mean, you got to dive in a little bit head first. Yeah. And also the, the power of youth right there. The young <laughs> yeah. ones being like, yeah, I can do a, a, a half Ironman with no training. That's psychotic if I were to do that today. But, you know, hats off to you. you. I mean, it's not like you didn't have an athletic background. I mean, we're playing, right, we're playing competitively. Right. 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 We have, we have a foundation built. But right. impressive, to say the least. Yeah. Yeah, I was hungry. I was hungry for something else, you know. And then I did my first few 70.3s with very little training. And then at one point, my dad was like... <laughs> 
my dad was like, you know what? If you just put a little extra effort into the preparation, I think you could be pretty good at this. And this is where we start to put things together, right? Start, yeah, this is where I was like, okay, I think you're right. So. We can train, we can prep, we can really focus and hone in on some things. Yeah. 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 So let's let's go down your athletic background a little bit because this is where I want to start and I want to I, I, I want to hear this journey that led you up to what you were doing there with these Ironmans, half Ironmans, and where you are as a runner, which is insanely impressive. And you've been through a lot. We've we've had great conversations of, you know, your time in college, being a competitive athlete, and some of the challenges that you face there. I know that we were riddled with injury, coming back from those sorts of things, and striking a balance with getting more into the mental aspect with breath work and yoga and getting to know yourself. But we got to start from the beginning. So as an athlete, when did you kind of find this groove to get into tennis and just sport in general? Where did this all start? So it all started, speaking of my dad, it all started with my dad. My dad got uh, me, my brother, and my sister all going on the court at age three. Uh, My dad himself was a gymnast and a pole vaulter picked up tennis later in life and I guess was just like, I want all my kids to be really good at this. So, uh, yeah, we all started at a very young age. I, um, I didn't start playing tournaments till I was eight. I mean, that's still young, but, um, and then I started, I started winning tournaments when I was 12. So how tennis works is there's a big like junior circuit. Um, and that 12, year age group can kind of signify like where you're going with the rest of your career. And so I had a pretty, pretty tough coach, um, around age 12. And I, I started winning some big tournaments and I think it was at that age that I got really hooked on competitiveness and, and sport. Um, I also think it was at that age that I started becoming very uh, self-aware of what it felt like to win versus to lose Mm. and uh, putting a lot of pressure on myself. I wanted to impress my coach. I wanted to impress, you know, the people around me. And so that all started around age 12, which is kind of young, I think, to have that like heightened sort of self-awareness. Oh, no question. No question it is. Um, So... Yeah, that's where it started. I mean, it's a lot of pressure for a kid. Uh, at 12 years old, you're, you you don't even know yourself yet, but you are developing yes. yourself. So to be in, in that environment, I could see that um, being a great place to learn yourself and to develop work ethic and to get stronger and understand how to just work and, and, and kind of go, go towards accomplishing a goal you want. But it can also take a turn. I've experienced this myself too, playing sports as a kid that I tied a lot uh, in, in my days playing baseball with my father, that most of our conversations were performance related. So it was how I did in a game. And so I don't think this was intentional by any means on his part, but I developed this feeling that I had to do well in a game for him to feel proud of me and to ultimately feel proud of myself. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think it's, it's that, that gets ingrained when you play sport at a young age. And then uh, you could probably relate to this, but I the fear of losing started growing louder in my head than, uh, you know, the confidence in just pure growth, right? And I don't think that you know, as a society, I don't think it's our parents' fault necessarily. I think just as a society, we don't do a great job when getting kids into sport at a young age of emphasizing like the growth factor rather than the result, right? Because we all want to, I mean, now, gosh, kids are signing at 13 or like 12, not maybe hopefully not 12, but 13 before ninth grade, kids are signing to college, right? So when we see that, it's just like, you know, progress, the, the, idea of progress and growth takes a back seat and it's all about where are you going? What's your ranking? You know, it's all outcome based. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of pressure. There are more resources than ever to start training at a young age, which is exciting, right? I think it turns out very well for a lot of people, but it can get again, quickly out of balance. I don't know how you keep that in check at that age. Yep. Cause I love sport. I mean, there's so many benefits to competing, but yeah, how you keep that relationship to yourself where it's somewhat separate from who you are. It's just something that you do, but there is a lot of pressure on outcome. Yeah. And when we focus on outcome, that's ultimately where we just get so tied up on, I think the wrong things instead of just enjoying what we are doing. Totally. 
Totally. And that, I mean, you and I talk about this a lot, but I think it carries over, you know, that sense of presence. Uh, all of this too is like something that you don't really understand fully until you just go through it. You know what I mean? Like when I was 12, 13, if you were to say like, hey, Christina, like enjoy the process, I would have mm. been like, ah, I need to, mean? right. I need to win. You know, I would have, it just would have completely gone in one year and out the other yeah. because I, I think sometimes when you, you know, you ask like, how, how do you manage that? Sometimes you just have to like make the mistakes and approach things a certain way that will lead to this way. And then you learn from that. Yes. Um, but I will say that like that outcome based sort of like extrinsic um, motivation approach, if you don't learn from it, it starts to carry over into your life. Right. So it's like, I want to win this match or this game. And then I want to go to the school and then I want to play in the lineup and then I need to get this job. And it's, it's just, it can be it ongoing. Yes. And you never find satisfaction in your life if you don't, uh, learn how to, how to like take a step back and just enjoy where you are. Yeah. Yeah. It starts to bleed into everything and take the joy out of it. And then that's where burnout happens. You get very down on yourself. I think that can lead to depression. I have been there where everything is so outcome focused and it's so much pressure. And there is a funny thing that happens when you start to step back and slow down and you find like this beauty in more of the process of things, which leads you to all the outcomes that you could ever really want. But they're the, it, it's more of a result of just good behavior and it's from a different energy source, I think internally. And that's sustainable because it's more from like love and appreciation there's a lot of balance and growth in there. And then the accomplishments, like they will come, they will happen as they naturally do, you know, cause you can find that balance of like, I care, I do care about performance. I care about improving and elevating where I'm at, but to rush that process with so much pressure when it gets out of balance just leads you down a bad road. Totally. Totally. I think like, I think that you start to enter into the next chapter of maturity in your life when you can figure out how to keep that fire going within you, but also maintain that sense of presence and gratitude. And, uh, you know, I'm sort of at a weird point where I like writing down goals or having goals for me can be, I can be a little bit averse to it just because mm. at, at each point in my life, I, like I listed, I wanted to go to this college now and then I wanted to the, play in this lineup. And then I wanted this job in New York and I got to every single goal I set for myself, but I didn't feel that sense of fulfillment. And so now I'm, I'm sort of navigating this like mm. chapter and phase in my life where I'm just like, you know, your girl still has goals. I, I have goals. I have a huge fire in me, but I need to figure out like you said, what am I bringing into my life, into the process that will then have me reach that goal? Like, am I bringing love to the process? Mm. Am I bringing good energy to the table? You know what I mean? It's, I less, do, about, yep. it's less about the thing and more about what I'm bringing to it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It makes perfect sense. I can relate heavy. Why, what was it not doing for you when you were just kind of checking the box with these achievements? Like, why were you not getting that fulfillment? Like, when you reflect back, like, what was missing? I think that... Oftentimes when we set goals, we also set expectations and we think that when we reach that goal, we expect for it to bring us happiness, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh my gosh, every single point in my life, I expected happiness and a heightened sense of like self-worth from reaching the college, the job, the relationship, et cetera. Mm. But when we expect to find happiness from something outside of ourselves, then we are always going to fall short always. And so I think that like, again, it's what you bring. It's what like you bring the light, you bring the joy, you bring the love and whether you're just bringing that to like the park with your friends or whether you're bringing it to like a big boardroom meeting, like you bring the same energy and you get, you'll get to where you want to be and, and you'll feel like what you're looking for rather than just like closing your eyes and trying to get there. And then you're there and you're just like, why am I still feeling empty? Mm. That's, that's a, that's a big one to learn. And to your point earlier, 
like I've, I've gone through that myself to like get from a place where I was very out of balance and doing that too. You're basically looking for things outside of yourself to, you know, make you feel good about yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and in my experience, like I was doing that with, and when I was gosh, like just out of school, um, I thought the big thing was, let me buy a new car that I wanted quickly learned that that was just a bill that I got. Right. But I was like, this is going to make me cool. I was like, let me get some new suits and new shoes. Right. And I was like, I'm going to be like James Bond. This is going to make me feel cool. But I was like, those are expensive. Uh And then you get it and you're like, that feeling went away quick. (laughs) And, uh, (laughs) I love a good suit though, but, uh, in goals, I was doing the same thing. I found that I was setting goals, uh, more based off of perception from like the outside world or my peers more than how it made me feel or the things that I wanted to do. Right. Which right. is a very different thing. Right. It's just, it's like the stuff that looked good or the stuff that I thought I should be doing versus the things that I wanted to be doing. Right. And I think we're the same in this too, is like, especially in fitness, it's so easy in this industry and in, in very like public facing industries to sort of be in it for uh, the wrong reasons. I hesitate to say right and wrong because it's, you know, a reason is a reason, but a reason that will lead you to that sense of like feeling empty in the Mm -hmm. end. You know, a lot of people will ask me, well, what do I do if I want to get into fitness? You know, how, what do I do? And I'm like, first you need to, to know why you want to, right? Do you want to do it to be on camera? Do you want to do it to like show off your abs? Do you want to do it like sort of for that image, Thing that it's all it's a human nature to kind of like like the attention right or do you want to do it to actually help people mm-hmm. because all of that is fun right we work on camera like it's fun and you know it's it's exciting but like at the end of the day you and I are there because we are trying to help people and mm-hmm. if we feel like we're not helping people then like we feel it it's loud and so we do everything that we can to do that and I think that it's really important to just like understand your why. Why do you want to wear the suit? Why do you want to be on camera? Why do you want to, you know, get here and here and here? Just always asking yourself, why? Why am I doing this? Yeah. Checking in constantly. But developing that self-awareness is difficult. That's a journey of itself, right? I'm still on it. I think it's a forever, I think it's a forever thing. Forever thing. You get to continue to check, you know, check in, you learn more and more about yourself. And as you do that, you can get, you know, more at peace with yourself, which is a beautiful feeling. I think that that's the ultimate goal in life is really just having a sense of calmness and peace in yourself as you go out and accomplish. Very different place. Because I can truthfully say for years, I was going uh, and trying to accomplish from a place of fear Mm -hmm. and anxiety, you know, of less than, Mm -hmm. than a place of abundance, if you want to put it that way. So how do you develop that? How did you develop that? Through mistakes, <laughs> through making mistakes and doing it the opposite way. I think that, you know, like feeling pain and feeling discomfort and feeling all of those like kind of icky things is always an entryway into change or a lesson. Feeling discomfort is always like that gateway into like, a new version of yourself, no matter how big or small. And like, I mean, you know, unfortunately this answer is like sort of, if, if somebody's looking for a concrete answer to how to find peace within yourself and I'm like, well, make mistakes, you know, that's, but that's the, that's the best I got. That is like the, that will ingrain lessons in you that can't be learned otherwise. Mm. And, uh, so I would say that like, if, if, if you just continue on with your life and make decisions and just constantly like really try and check in with yourself again, just keep asking yourself, why, why am I doing this? And how is it making me feel right? Why am I doing this? How is it making me feel? And am I able to bring my best self to the table here? Am I able to bring my best energy to the table? And if one of those things sort of feels off, then that's a really good place to, to ground yourself. I think, you know, this is all, this all falls under the umbrella of mindfulness. And, um, honestly, it's, 
again, we, we look for external things to help us out. We look for external things to find peace. We have to go on this vacation and then maybe we'll find peace. We have to be in this relationship and then maybe we'll find peace. But like mindfulness and asking yourself questions that just reflect on what's going on in your life is the most powerful tool. It just, it's not that immediate sense of strong gratification. It's like, it's a little bit of work it takes. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it's on, work. it's ongoing work. A lot of work. Cause if you're, so this is where like, you can call this, I think meditation or whatever your self-care practices are checking in with yourself. You don't just do it one time, get better. And then like, okay, we're, we're great. I mean, it's just like training too. You can get to a level, but if you stopped training at that level, you're going to lose it. So there, and it is a messy process. Mm -hmm. So when, when this question is asked and you hear people talk about like, how do you develop self-awareness or you're getting advice from different people? Um, I, I, I've always found it very hard to get a straight answer. And I think that there is a reason for that. And if it is, if it seems clean, I just don't think that that's really it. Cause there's, there's a science to this. There can be like a bit of, Hey, so here's some tools and strategies, but it is heavy on, you know, if you want to call it an art to understanding yourself and navigating yourself. And like you said, making mistakes. Yeah. And I'm a big believer in, and it's easier to say, as years go by that those hard times, you know, when I've been at lows, like depressed, um, for long stretches, even for years, um, you start to recognize when you're pulling yourself out of it. And I think that those down moments in your life can be some of the most beautiful and powerful if you decide to use them as such. Mm -hmm. If you continue to take destructive behavior and keep pushing yourself down, that can lead to, you know, some very bad things, I think. But if you can use that and sit still with yourself, I think it's more your kind of like your body trying to tell yourself that you need to make some changes. Yep. That some, something to sound like when you're feeling depressed, when you're feeling like anxious in these emotions, I really think it's more a signal that even if you're not consciously aware of it yet, something needs to alter. Yep. Right. Yep. Pain is a message in your body that something needs to change. Like, and our brain is really smart. Our brains are really, really powerful, but we have to tell it what we want. And oftentimes, you know, it's as powerful and smart as it is, it's also lazy. So when we continue to do the same things and kind of make the same decisions and repeat the same patterns, like that's what our brain is going to do. And to build those new highways, it takes effort and it takes work. Yeah. And, but it, but it works. Like one day in the studio, right? I was having a hard time and you sat me down and you said, write down what version of yourself you want to be. And like, be very specific about it. Be very clear, lay out what that looks like, what that feels like, what that sounds like. Right. And, and write it down. And the act of doing something like that is the work it takes to create that new highway in your brain and tell your brain what you want mm -hmm. and it will listen, but you have to do it and you have to do it repetitively. Cause you know, we're all, we're all sort of wired the opposite way, right? We're all wired to, uh, do things that feel easy. We're all wired to do things that give us that immediate sense of gratification, that sort of like hit of dopamine, mm -hmm. right? But the long-term joy and that long-term self-awareness is built in sort of the weeds and the work and we got to plant and we got to grow. And, you know, you do that for a, enough time and eventually you'll start to see your garden and it's, it's beautiful. It is, but you're right. It takes a lot of effort. And I always saw it like it, it should, it makes sense sure. to me that it should, because to your point, we want to get to a spot like the, the way that we're wired is just human beings is you want to follow the path of least resistance. Cause if you were just going around all day and making new decisions all the time, it's too much stress. Yeah. So there needs to be a level of, of autonomy where we get into habits and routines. And that has to do with your self-talk that has to do with your morning routines, whatever it is you do, like you have habitual things in nature in you. Right. Yeah. So to alter that takes a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. And so sometimes it takes, that's why I go back to these down moments. That's why I see them now as a blessing because sometimes it takes a tremendous amount of pain for you to feel, to understand, I don't want to feel this anymore so that you can start to alter. Yep. Cause it's not just as easy as a conscious 
thing of like, yeah, I know I should be eating better. I know I should be doing this. I should be doing, I know a lot of things I should be doing, but I, I think you have to feel it yep. to make true change. Cause yeah. you will continue to just do the same thing over and over and over again, even if you know it's not serving you, but you will not stop that behavior until it gets so bad. Yeah. Then something alters. Yeah. Yeah. You, I forget the exact quote. I heard somebody say it once, but you know, t- to do something over and over again that is hurting you, um, you got to be kind of tough, right? And so I, that we're, like, we live in this world with the idea of like mental toughness, and oftentimes, you know, I look at points in my life and I'm like, wow, I really, I got through that, and that was hard, but. I was also making the same mistake over and over again and making it harder for myself. So being mentally tough isn't always like going to serve you, right? It's it's like it's being mentally sort of like malleable and resilient. Mm. And um, obviously we know I'm a big like physical mobility nerd, but I would all I would also maybe translate that into like the this like emotional mobility or emotional agility. This like just this this um, willingness to make a change that doesn't uh, put yourself in so much pain, you know. And and that's tough. Yes. Like, and and as you're sitting here and and as we're talking about this, I'm thinking to myself like back to to you know this question that was a catalyst for this conversation it's just like how do we build this how do we do this some a lot of times like it's okay if you ask for help or get help from other people like there are points in my life where I, I've surrounded myself purposely or, or kind of just like accidentally with people who I really look up to and who have an impact on me and who are kind of living the life that like I want Mm -hmm. and just being around that is really powerful right but you have to like you have to sort of like move the pieces in your life so that you are around that how did you do that let's get specific in this because I I fully agree with you I've done the same exact thing I came from corporate America and then I moved into fitness right like that was a massive life transition and being around certain people that lived and breathed this yep it gets you into a different mindset and even into a different environment and way of being that you wouldn't do by yourself, right? Like just being in it, you get unconscious now and you're just moving kind of with them. Cause that's that, I think that's like, if you want to call it, I hate the word hacking, but it's like, it's kind of like getting yourself in a space where you don't have to think about the habit being built because other people are doing it and there is human nature to follow your peer group. So if you're around these people enough, you're going to start to adopt the habits so when did this start to change for you? Like, how did you start to do that? What were you trying to get to? Yeah. And you, did you do this consciously? So uh, I, when I was in college, I was around uh, people who like the environment wasn't that supportive. It didn't, it wasn't like, um, it didn't really give me a plat it didn't really make me feel like my best self I mean that's such an understatement it was like really I was around other people who were struggling and I was around people whose values were different than mine and it's nobody's fault it's just like where I ended up and so when I left college for a year I started traveling and I started meeting new people whose values were uh completely different than that right like Um, I lived in Canada for a little bit and I was around um, a lot of like British and Australian people and they were all like, you Americans, you guys work too hard. Your, your entire focus and your entire purpose is work. And like, what about your relationships and what about having fun and Mm -hmm. what about, and so just being around that was powerful enough for me to start to realize like, oh wow, everything that you know, our society has sort of ingrained in us from that young age. Um, maybe, maybe this is not the way of life. Like maybe I can have a little bit of fun and find some joy there, Mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, maybe, maybe the friendships that I have with people are, should be a priority over work. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so really like 
when you're around people whose values feel good for you, like just, it's a feeling thing more so than like a cerebral thing for me. It's just, cause anybody can say anything about their values. Right. But it's like, how does that, how does it feel to be around that person? Does it make you want to be better? Does it make you feel like, you know, you're, you're solid. You got your two feet on the ground. Maybe are you inspired by that person? Like put yourself in front of those people. Uh, that's huge. That's huge. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 powerful stuff. I mean, our we t- I I am kind of a hermit. You and I are both introverts, right? We can yep. like easily just sort of like go oh, through yeah. something by yourself, and uh, we'll come out on top. But it's okay to have help, and it's okay to have support. Yep. Uh, it does take a little bit of effort, though. Like it does take some shifting. You might have to shift some other people around so that you can put yourself in front of, you know. The right people. Yeah. Yeah. But the feeling, this is a feeling process to me. Ultimately it is because I, I consider myself an empath. I feel energy heavily. And so, you know, I learned from a young age, uh, I put a lot of trust in people and what they said to me early on. And then that did not always work out. So you pay attention more to the action, to the energy, like you said, that they're bringing and who they really are, you know, here that makes a big difference, like with their intention and the, this really struck me. I think it's a great point that, um, you made me remember where I was at when I was kind of going through this of just getting a different perspective and how powerful that is. Cause travel and then seeing other people and different ways of life, just that alone, just seeing what possibilities are there is a heavy first step in my opinion to just understand possibilities. I was stuck in you know, a a traditional, a kind of American family and told to go to corporate America. And I was in that world. I was like, you know, college, corporate nine to five. And I was, I was stuck there. And I thought that that was it until I got an opportunity to get into the modeling space. And I got to meet the most incredible thing about that space was the people I got to meet from all around the world. And that changed my entire life. That was the start of it because I started to meet photographers that were saying, I've lived abroad. I go travel where I want. I work here and here. It's not a nine to five job. They're like freelancing. You meet different models that are like, I live here during this part of the year, here during this part. There's so much more freedom and flexibility. And I started to see more life to your point that they that work was something, it's a means to an end. It's not the thing. Yeah. It wasn't the identity. And in America, we are tying our identities to what we do, not who we are. Yep. And it's a big disconnect. I think that that goes against our human nature at a soul level, big time. Totally, totally, totally. And, you know, there's a line there too, though. You know, like there's, you can you can approach your work in a, in a purposeful way and have it yeah. mean a lot to you. Yes. And you can give yourself the flexibility to have like, more adventure in your life and, and just sort of like have your, have your foundational values and priorities outside of work. Like, cause then, you know, I, I look at some of those people I was with a couple, a couple of 10 years ago, whatever, uh, in Canada. And, you know, maybe now they're, they're still not working at all. And they're sort of like, which they're, they could be very happy, but I know you and I, we feel purpose and work. And yeah, that's, that's for okay sure. too. I, I, I need it. It's just like walking that line. It's mm-hmm. just always, again, reminding yourself, like sometimes you can kind of teeter to the other side of the line. And then it's just like, oh my gosh, okay. I need to like put some of my eggs in this basket. And maybe, you know, I need to go like take a trip with Tina and like feel some of that, you know, worldliness and get that cup filled and then mm-hmm. come back. And I, it's just this constant like line and I think that's a forever thing. Like we're just going to be walking that line and making mistakes and like, Oh, I'm too far on the side. I'm too far on the side. Like that is life. And it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I think you get better at it obviously as you go. Yeah. But that's been kind of, that's, that's been a revelation to me, uh, that as I've gotten older, um, and had more experience that early I sought value through accomplishment, through my work, through my title, through, income earned and thinking that achieving that would allow me to achieve some level of balance or I would get that feeling going back to what we were talking about earlier. There was that external pull to make the internal feel good. 
And it's been an inverse flip now where you start to realize that it's the internal balance of finding that peace in yourself, learning yourself and understanding what fulfillment means to you. And then the, you know, external just kind of happens um, because you're following, you know, I I call it a passion, you know, um, a calling, if you will. I think there are natural things that each individual is just gravitated to. And that is the, that is, that is the purpose of life to me is just following that. Yeah. Is stepping into yourself and creating a calmness in yourself, almost unlearning a lot of what our culture has taught us so that you can get back to a spot of being like, I want to pursue this or I like this, this fulfills me. Um, and going down that, going down that road, totally. it's the ultimate. Absolutely. I mean, you're, I think that like living life again, walking that slack line of life, but like living it like both actively and passively, right? Mm. Like you put yourself in certain experiences and you're like, what can I take from this experiment, from this experience, right? Like you go to Africa and you spend some time there and you meet all these incredible people and you immerse yourself in a new culture and you find parts of yourself that you didn't know. And then you come back here and it's just like, okay, what can I, I'm not going to live there. Right. Sometimes we, I mean, when I was in Canada, I was like, I'm just going to live here and be like a ski bum. And yeah. There was that's a moment. The rest of my there was life. a moment. I yeah. thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's okay. Right. But it's just like, no, it's, a, it's also okay to like realize that there are parts of this I love and I want to actually take it back to this part of my yeah, life. And so right. I think that is living actively and then living passively is just sort of like releasing the steering wheel and being okay with how things happen. Mm. And again, like walking that slack line, it's just like putting yourself in experiences and always asking yourself, what do I like that I can take and, and apply this to my life and to the people that I'm around. And then also just being like, all right, things happen the way they happen. And like, I'm going to keep moving forward. So some of the tools that maybe we can get a little specific on like some of the tools that you've kind of used or or experiences you've gone through to, to help you like begin to cultivate this self-awareness, right? Cause we we hit this low, right? Where like as an athlete, I know you were battling injury a lot and I know we're battling with like self-worth towards achievement. And then to be injured in the middle of that is I know you went through obviously is going to play with your head. But the point is to relate to this, no matter what your story is, there's a bottom that we hit. I've, I've hit it, you know, you, you hit these spots And so getting out of that and being there, going back to that can become a gift because you can start to be like, I need to make changes. I need to learn myself now, right? To pull myself out of this. But what were some steps that you started to take and why did you start to take them to start to change your relationship with yourself? Yeah. So then at that point in my life, um, it was battling injury. It was battling eating disorder. It was battling depression. It was, I mean, like check, check, check. I, I, went to the doctor and I like filled out this form and it was like, do you have a healthy relationship with food? No. Are you happy? No. It was like literally checking boxes. I was like, wow. Okay. I'm at, I'm at this point in my life and I'm 16. Um, and then I didn't have, I didn't have an awareness of the tools that I do now. So back then, you know, how I, I think overcame that was, um, like we talked about just kind of like, putting myself in, in new experiences and realizing that there's more to life than what my 16 years were, which was tennis, a wonderful family, like a really great school, but it was like tennis, 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 self-worth was tennis. And so I think at that point, um, putting myself in new experiences was absolutely key. And then uh, being able to realize that I found a lot of fulfillment in the fact that I wasn't alone in what I went through. Like there were, you know, when I transferred schools and I had sort of a clearer head, I saw a lot of other girl, female athletes struggling with the same thing. And I was like, wow, I think I can help them. I just don't know how yet, Mm. but I think I can help them. Right. And then I found movement in a different way outside of sport. And I found that, you know, it was kind of like fulfilling that part of me that was like, wow, I love movement. And this is also empowering people. I want to, I want to do that. I took a spin class and I was like, people are moving. People are feeling confident. People are feeling good in their skin. Like I'm like wildly passionate about helping people feel good in their skin. So that's how I think, you know, being, realizing that I can help people. 
and putting myself in new experiences was key then. And then at this point in my life, after going through different emotional struggles, I found meditation and breath work. And um, that's not something that you could have paid me to get into when I was 16. I just like my brain wasn't like fully formed that way. Uh, but at this point in my life, in my late 20s, understanding the brain on like a biochemical level is very healing for me. Like understanding why somebody gets sad or understanding why somebody feels attached or understanding, you know, why you wake up in the morning and maybe you don't feel good, but you can't put your finger on why. Like Mm -hmm. these are like chemical reactions in the brain and, and being able to, to realize that with meditation and with breath work, these are two scientific ways to start to manipulate that in, in a manner that like feels better for us has been really powerful for me in the past two years. Um, and so at this point in my life, as, as you know, like I am really passionate about bringing uh, meditation and breath work into the wellness scene um, and into you know, helping people beyond just a physical level. It's a huge, I mean, it's, it's the counterbalance because if we're pushing all this pressure into performing, performing and whatever your discipline of training is, if you're pushing physically, then you're neglect, you can be neglecting something mentally. And this is where I have seen it. And I have done this myself where I put so much of thinking that I was improving myself and doing all the right things that I put all this energy where I was confused and wanting to make changes in my life into my physical body. So I would train and take all this energy and just run and lift and run and lift two hours, three hours a day, not knowing that I was actually running from some, some, some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I see a lot of people do it. Yeah. And look, I think I had to go through it. I think you have to go through it and it's not Look, it's, it's, it's not an unhealthy thing to put your energy towards. Obviously I saw it as that I knew I was going through something and yeah, you're building yourself up physically, but at some point, like you hit this wall and you need to address things because you can be running away from your problems, you know, and putting them into your muscles, you know, as as they (laughs) say. Uh, <laughs> I haven't heard that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, That's a man. good visual. You know, so, so yeah, you know, so you can, you know, you can, there can be some benefit there, but ultimately you got to get back no in touch. No wonder you have huge biceps. Yeah, yeah. I was like really sad for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Dude. Man. Oh man. Uh, but, <laughs> but it's true, right? It's true. It, like being honest, I did yeah. do that. Like yeah. I, I look, I went through some, I went through some stuff like my father and my grandfather died like in, in like 2016. And I did not know what to do with myself with the energy. And like, I really took that extra energy and put it into the gym. I didn't know how to deal. And I started to go to therapy and I started to, you know, understand what these emotions started to mean. And that's when my life started to take a whole new direction. And when we get into things like meditation, it adds you know, a balance to your life. You start to recognize how useful the lows are and how appreciative the highs are and how like being down here can help you catapult to up here Mm -hmm. um, and stepping into alignment with yourself. Mm -hmm. So the mental aspect of training cannot be neglected. Mm -hmm. You can try, but it will catch up to you at some point. So with meditation, what were your early experiences with meditation? Because I feel like sometimes, you know, getting into it, People may not understand what the process entails, yeah. how long, if you want to call it that, it takes to be able to tap into a benefit of meditation to understand what it is. What was that like for you? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was like exposed to the idea of meditation when I was, you know, 14 years old playing at this tennis academy in Florida. Like it wasn't packaged in the meditation box, but it was like, uh, mindfulness and kind of presence. And, and I mean, at that point, again, it was like in one ear and out the other, I was just like, throw me in the physical thing, whatever. Um, and then later in life, it, 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 it's, you know, become hot and trendy and it, as it should be, I mean, it's not trendy. It's been around for literally thousands of years, but now people are like, whoa, okay, this stuff works. But I still was like, 
a little resistant to it, like over the past few years, because in the box that it was packaged to me in, it was like a little woo woo for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that happily the universe was like, girl, you are gonna, you are going to find this and you are going to get into it. Like, let's try and serve it to you this way. And after, you know, some emotional struggle in my life, I, I just, decided, let me go, let me try this again because nothing else was working. And that's oftentimes when people find meditation is when you are deep, deep, deep in the hole. And you're like, let me give this a go. Cause mm-hmm. like nothing else is working. Mm-hmm. And luckily that happened. Um, I, I think that like when people are first getting into meditation, you know, we hear about the monkey mind and I'm, I'm a very visual girly. So in my brain, I'm like, okay, there's a monkey and it's at the control panel and it's tapping all these buttons in the limbic system. And like our limbic system is the part in our brain. That's like fear, frustration, distraction. It's just like it, it, it serves us if we need to like get out of danger. Mm. Um, but it's firing all the time now, right? We hear that we're in this, like we live in a world of stress so that, that monkey is pressing all those buttons and to just sit and tell somebody to tell the monkey to stop pressing the limbic system buttons doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can't just, that's not how your nervous system works. Like the monkey's not going to listen if you just sit there and tell it to stop. In fact, you're calling attention to it. And oftentimes when people start meditating, they call attention to like their problems and then it, and it freaks them out more. And so this is where breath work comes in. And this is where I found both at the same time, luckily, because breath work is a physical practice that again, not woo woo, it literally will shift your blood chemistry in a way that tells the monkey and your brain to lay off the buttons, take a seat, and then maybe start paying attention to like your prefrontal cortex buttons, which are like decision making, like a clearer thinking, you know, kind of able to organize your emotions better. And, but that's not going to happen by just telling it to stop. You have to start to use your breath in a way that shifts all this shit around in your body that then tells your mind you can relax. And when we can sort of override the system using our breath like that, we just set ourselves up in a better place to focus, to problem solve, to sift through emotions, figure out oh, why are we feeling this way, right? Mm-hmm. And then that's a really nice clean slate to start meditating. But oftentimes, like when I've worked with, you know, high level people, highly functioning people, you you take them out of their office and you tell them to sit down and tell the monkey to chill. It's just, it's not going to happen. And so that's where breath work comes in is breath work is the physical practice. It is getting your body to tell your mind to chill. And then once that happens, then we can start to like get into the meditative aspect, whether, I mean, there's a lot of different types, right? There's, uh, visualization and there's, um, the one that I really like is just sort of like creating the mind that I want to bring to the rest of my life. So if I'm sitting on the pillow, I was, I'm like, what does that mind feel like? Right. It's loving, it's caring, it's, uh, you know, warm. It doesn't have to be at, like, it can be colors. And then the most important thing that I would say coming out of meditation is curate the mind that you want there and then bring it into your life off the pillow. Mm. But there are all these steps, right? Like I like start with the breath work. I mean, people are so there, all of us have this like crazy ass monkey in our minds today with social media and with just like the way that our culture is with everything going on in the world. Like how can we not? So it takes a couple of these precursor steps to get there. Yeah. There's, I think, a default setting. I don't know what you want to call it. That most people, I think, when you get overwhelmed, feeling anxious or wherever, uh, kind of fear-based feelings, the tendency is to kind of do more of them, like to do more action. And it's like more things and you're just adding and you're just digging yourself deeper into a hole. And I don't think that you realize until you really slow down how you're self-inflicting a lot of the problems where all you really need to do is let go. Yeah. Breathe. Um, and you can start to do less and do more things intentionally when you can get more in touch with yourself. The meditation in the beginning took, took me a while. Yeah. 
to really understand what was being done. Um, I experienced a lot of just a, a lot of chatter yeah. early on. Uh, so many different thoughts going on. And uh, it took me about a month consistently doing this probably two, three times a week at least where I, I was in Cape Town at the time doing uh, at a yoga studio doing like guided meditations. Cool. Yeah. And, and in the beginning, I remember my head just being so frazzled. I just heard so many conflicting thoughts, but I just stuck with it. I was like, I'm going to do something different. I want to stay in this space. And speaking to some of the yoga instructors there, they were encouraging me to just stay in touch, be patient with it. Eventually the thoughts started to get more clear and like isolated. Yeah. Cause you were doing it so often you, you started to realize I'm, I'm hearing the same things. You're starting to understand them now. Yeah. And you can start to organize. And then the more I started to do it, you realize these are things I need to address things that I've been ignoring. Yep. Didn't even realize it. Then you can start to attack them. Then it, then there's an action-based item to it where like you start to identify things. Then I would start to make decisions and take action that would start to alleviate these things or create a relationship to them and understanding to them. Or I could remove certain things, right, from my life. Mm-hmm. And something that the yoga teacher said to me too was like a good session to her was one that really met in some form of emotion of like, of tears. Yes. And it didn't mean sadness. It meant like an understanding of something beautiful happening. Yeah. Like just getting in touch with something beautiful. Yeah. An appreciation, gratitude, feeling loss, but feeling those emotions, they need to be felt. It's like your body needed to feel them. Yeah. For you to be able to move forward. That's like healing trauma. Totally. Totally. I think, um, you know, when, uh, the one thing that unfortunately kills people the fastest, right? We hear about stress and anger and it's suppression. Like it's, it's people not, and this is, this is like, this is in scientific journals. It's literally suppressing your emotions that will kill people the fastest. Wow over stress and over anger and over those negative feelings. And when, you know, we go through life, like you were saying, and we just try and hold on tighter and do things harder, that is a way of not looking at like what we're feeling. And when you're sitting there, right, and you're in that yoga studio in South Africa and you're, and you're like looking right at the monkey and you're like, wow, this doesn't really feel good. But then you do it more and more and then you're just like, this just is what it is and I'm, I'm okay. You're acknowledging those emotions finally. And that, like, that step cannot be bypassed. And I, I mean, I don't think we, we don't learn how to do this as kids. Mm. I didn't. Maybe now we are a little bit more. Um, you know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing these like, uh, I don't know if you've seen these like emotion circles where there's all these emotions listed in like a colorful rainbow circle and kids can like point to, you know, I'm feeling angry and then it can kind of like go deeper. Why are you feeling angry? I'm feeling angry because I'm feeling sad or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But certainly when I was growing up, you know, I, I wasn't taught this and I, and it's as important as learning math and English and science. Like you, ha- like we learning how to acknowledge and then regulate your emotions is such a skill. And I think that when like the world would be different if we all could do that better. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's like, that's so powerful. It's just like your experience sitting there. Also like when you sit there and, and you can't run from it, it's, it's, it's huge because we live in a world where you can always run from it, even in therapy, yeah. even in therapy, you're in therapy for an hour and then, and then you leave and you're just like, you know, you back, can go back right to back my in. bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, what, mm-hmm. what is a sustainable practice here? I mean, I, I went on a week long silent retreat where I couldn't run from anything. Right. But not everybody's going to do that. So what, what is a sustainable practice to just start building slowly into this, Um, like version of self that's okay with feeling what we're feeling. I told you this morning walking into work, like I was feeling super stressed. I mean, it's 8 a.m. And when you're traveling in New York, 8 a.m. on the subway, it's just a friggin' nightmare. Like, and 
I, I'm everywhere I'm walking. I'm just like, there's a crowd of people around me and I can't yeah. move and people are shoving me. And, and I'm like, I'm like, I don't want to live here anymore. Like the monkey is just like, boop, 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 pressing all the buttons. Right. I'm like, I need to move out of New York. Yeah, New York I, does I that suck. Too, yeah. Like how, yeah. how am I getting to this point just from people shoving me? Yeah. And <laughs> so I'm like walking out of 57th and I'm like walking up the stairs through a crowd of people. And I'm just like, okay, you know what? I'm frustrated. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling, you know, this. And once I just started telling myself that, it's like, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Before you know it, you're at the top of the steps, you're in wide open air, and you're you're walking to your next thing. Yeah. You start to realize that it's also your environment that is impacting your mood and your feelings. Yeah. Understanding how to separate the two is a big skill, going back to your point. It took me a long time to learn that. When I got back from K-Town and I went to New York, there was this thing that has stuck with me ever since where I found that all this peace and calmness through meditation and yoga and a spiritual practice like in Cape Town, right? And then you get to New York, which is the entire opposite <laughs> of that experience. It is not the same. So looking at people, the sea of people, of just like people frantic and chaos and anxious all over the place, right? I had my headphones and I had in this meditation song that I found in Cape Town and I just put it in and I just remember feeling like it was Mm -hmm. just falling off me. Mm -hmm. Like all this chaos, like whatever was around me, I would find my center. And that, I, I go back to that thought all the time of like, that is a goal to me of no matter what is around me, can I find a way internally to create a sense of calmness? Yeah. It's the perfect place to practice. It is a great place is, to practice. It is yeah. perfect place. Managing a, your emotions. Yeah. Gosh, it's like a Petri dish of stress. Here. <laughs> and like, it's, it's just like, it's a perfect place to just like, to just like, it's, it's the practice ground. And then like, that's life, man. Dude, it it's sounds silly, like, but it is. It is. And then when you find it, it's that much more powerful because it wasn't easy. Yeah. Nothing, nothing easy is ever worth it. Right. So when you can find that sense of peace and self in the Petri dish of stress, then you can also like spread that. And then that's what feels really good. That's what you and I do. Right. We're lucky to be doing that. We can like spread our good energy and help people. And like that, I think, you know, that's finding self peace and, and worth is great. But then when you can like teach other people how to do it. You're oh, just it's everything. Like, yeah. Yes. Yes. That's just, it's healing, man. That's, that's train. That's what training has been to me. And that's how I see it. It's like a place to heal. Mm-hmm. We're all hurting in like some way. I really believe that. And it's like, this is a place to work on yourself and create that calmness in yourself and improvement. That's why when you tap into the mental side, the meditation and you understand what that is now I've seen when I'm lifting, it's like a moving meditation yeah. to me. Yeah. Cause I'm ta- you're tapping into You're breath work. Yep. You're creating presence by yeah. Understanding that I've been distracted previously. So can you create a sense of calmness in the middle of you doing maybe some chaotic yep. movement? Yep. And then that's going to translate to like the hard conversation that you have to have with your boss, mm. you know, and then that's going to translate to walking up the crowded subway steps. Like it's just like being able to find presence in any state of stress. A state of stress is lifting a barbell. A state of stress is having a tough conversation with your boss. Like, finding strength and peace within a state of stress is because like we're not we're not ever going to escape stress that's like trying to escape air like we're just not we're not going to do that right so it's we have to learn how to approach it and how to use it and how to deal with it and how to uh like be better from it 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 will make you better but you have to choose to to see it that way Mm -hmm. i agree and what's funny about this is when you go down this road and the more I've tapped into like this, you know, med- just the mental practices of things and like self care, more like self love and less viewing my value from my output, the more I produce, which is a funny thing. Yeah. Cause I, I do, I do care about, like, I like to work. Yeah. I, I want to put out good things. Yeah. But now it's from that different place. And this is what we were talking about earlier. Now it feels like a place of like I'm giving. Yeah. Right. It's like an art form now. It's like a method of self-expression versus longing and needing you to validate me and, and looking for those external factors. And these are two very, very different places of energy for creation. Cause I think we all want to create, but it's like, what, what's the source though? Totally. I completely agree. Like I run, I want to run a sub three hour marathon. Right. But I think that, you know, again, 
let's take it back to the beginning. Like, why do I want to do that? I want to do that because like, I want to show that it's possible for people who didn't grow up running. I want to do that because, you know, I want to really absorb the process of working for something like that. And like, you know, coming off this knee surgery last year and running that marathon and doing really well in PRing, that was like the first athletic and competitive experience in my life where I went in not being afraid of losing, not being afraid of falling short. I was like, I'm doing this because I want people who had knee surgery to see that they can come back in eight months. And like with that why and with that motivation, it was crazy, Joe. Like I, my brain, I've never felt my brain like that. My brain was like, let's go, bitch. Like, let's go. You know, it was, it was in my corner rather than working against me. Dude, that was going to be my next question. (laughs) Which do, I don't want to gloss over this. That was an enormous accomplishment to go through that surgery and then to PR. Yeah. And you're, that was wild. Dude, yeah. seeing that time, we were all cheering for you. Like, dude, how she just dominated that. And I know people have a tough time with recovery. I mean, how could you not? Injury, injury sucks. It sidelines you. People struggle with that mentally, but it sounds like you were more prepared to handle it and see it as part of your training to get to this other side. Yeah. Like you were really prepared. I feel yeah. like you set yourself up so well. Yeah. I put it, I put it on the, you know, I was, I remember seeing some other elite female athlete, like two days after I got my surgery, I'm on my couch. I have this big transformer thing on and I'm like, you know, I'm going through a lot. I'm going through a lot personally. I'm going through, I can't work. Like we need our body to work. I'm just like, what do I, oh my God, I'm in a, I'm in a tough place and I'm on Instagram. Instagram can be used for good. Here's an example. And I'm (laughs) seeing this elite athlete and she had come back from this like, uh, hip thing and she'd come back fairly quickly and I was like it oh my gosh it was so inspiring and I just thought I I can do that and then I want somebody else to see that I did that and to know that they can do it you know and it's just this like it's just this kind of like pay it forward thing and so when I put that race on the calendar you know I was motivated by that and I was also driven to really uh hold myself accountable in the process i mean it's easy it's so easy to start to slack off with something like this right you get past that two month mark you are nowhere near close to ready but a lot of times people will feel good enough and then they'll slack off and it's like no i'm trying to run 26 miles coming off of this i got to keep going for the next several months as hard as i started Mm. And that's not, it's not a matter of motivation. We talk about this all the time. It's a matter of just holding yourself accountable and like staying disciplined and having, uh, just having something that you are working towards, but like for the, for the sake of the process, not the sake of how you're actually going to do on that day. Changes things big time. Yeah. And to do it, to inspire other people, if that was a big gravitating force for you, that's a different energy, man. Doing something for yourself is one thing, but I, I think it's a much more powerful mechanism when you're thinking about like how you're here to help other people yeah. through like using your body as like a vessel yeah, to inspire other people. Yeah. I, I was talking to that. I was talking to, I wanted Christina in eight months running the marathon. I wanted Christina sitting on the couch in her transformer leg to be like, damn, she's cool. Like I, I wanted to work towards that girl. Right. And that's what I'm trying to do in my life now, honestly, is just like talk to like young Christina mm. and just be like, hey, this is what you can take all of this pain and all of this adversi- adversity. Like this is where it's going to go. This is what you can do with it. Hey, young Christina, who thought breath work was like woo woo and a waste of time. Hey, let me try and package this for you now in a way where like you understand why this is important. Um, and I think like if we can all we hear, you know, there's, there's this like child in us and we hear that all the time, but like, what does that really mean? Can we act in a way now to like make that child in us look up to us? If that makes sense. Cause there are plenty of people who resemble that child in us. Right. And so that's who we're talking to and that's what we're doing things for. That's our why. I I think as a coach, that's very powerful. I think that's where we find our strength as coaches is really just being the force that like the light that you needed totally at the time. Totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's where I come from. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. is what you can relate most heavily to. So to close out, what would you say to her right now? Young Christina at 16, 110 pounds, 5'8", not, you know, not really being able to, I don't know, get out of bed that easily in the morning. I would say to her that every superhero overcame something to be a superhero and to figure out what their superpower was, right? It, that that whole pain and discomfort as the gateway to change and the gateway to something bigger than yourself that you will then use to like be a superhero in your life. You have to go through what you're going through now. And I, I remember looking back at certain points in my life and being like, that was a failure, you know, dropping out of my first school, dream school, that was a failure. But I'm at this point in my life where like, I, I just don't see things that way anymore. I don't see things as failures. It's like, it's just, it's just another page that you turn to like continue on with the book. And what is, what would be unfortunate is if you just can, don't want to keep learning from it. Like just continue learning from it, right? So that you can keep writing your book. Um, but something that feels like a failure in the moment, oftentimes you look five, 10 years later and you're just like, I see why that happened. That was so important in my life. Yeah, yeah. I, that's it's a huge lesson to learn. It kind of comes from a place to that I think if you can understand, and I don't know who needs to hear this, but I know I needed to hear this, that you're enough right now. Like all you have to do is just be you. That is enough. And then the things that happen to you, they're just lessons. Just keep paying attention. Take something from it. Yeah. Learn from it. Yeah. Grow from it. But don't let it be a thing that you tie your worth to. Yeah. Things happen. Life is going to navigate. I'm going to be, and you're going to, you're going to be different things throughout every phase of your life. You're going to have different careers. You're going to be doing different things physically. You're going to train in different ways. You're going to do different challenges. You're going to have low points in life, high points in life. They, they do not define you. You're always you. Mm -hmm. Just learn from it. Just keep getting better from it and keep building. Mm -hmm. it, when you look at it that way, it's a totally different outlook on life. Completely. Completely. KC. I see a full human being. This is everything that I thought it was going to be. <laughs> no. This is a great talk, man. This is our usual daily talk. In the yeah, we talk about this stuff studio. forever. <laughs> forever. Listen, I'm sure that we'll do this again, but um, th thanks for joining us. Thanks for, for sharing, for, for just being transparent about your journey, your life, and, and for just being a great coach, for being a great leader, man. Thanks for having me, Joe. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. See you guys.